Hello, and welcome once again to the Justin Center Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. And I just want to give you all a quick reminder that Justin Center is supported by donors. So if you have appreciated and have benefited from in whatever way you have the work that we do as an organization, we ask that you would consider becoming a contributor. You can do that on a monthly basis, or you can do that uh, with a one-time gift. You can go to justincenter.org, go to a donate page. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means that any gifts you choose to give to us are tax deductible. All right. So uh, we, on the last program in this series, we began looking through a PowerPoint that I had put together on the basics of Trinitarian theology. We're explaining the Trinitarian language that we use, that the church has chosen to use throughout history. Uh, we began talking about the biblical reasons for believing in things like the the filioque, or not the filioque, well, partially, but the the eternal generation of Christ and the procession of, of the Holy Spirit. We did just talk a little bit about the, the filioque, but, uh, but we have a whole separate program on that particular issue. Um, so I didn't get through the entirety of this PowerPoint that I put together. I went to the hour mark and then I stopped. So on this program, I'm going to be continuing what we had uh, been talking about. So we're going to continue our, our look at some basic Trinitarian ideas and Trinitarian theology and, and terminology. So the next term that we are going to be looking at is perichoresis. And perichoresis is a term that is helpful insofar as it goes, <laughs> uh, but I don't like what a lot of people in modern times have often done with the idea of perichoresis. Um, but we, we could talk about that maybe another time. But uh, let's see. So I have from Revere, Funk and Widener here. And again, Widener is, was the basis for my outline that I'm using here. Not everything was directly from there, but, but he helped put together some of the quotes that I'm using here. So uh, Widener defines perichoresis in this way. He says, by the essential perichoresis is meant that mutual and most peculiar inherence and imminence by which one divine person, by virtue of the unity of essence, is within another. So that's perichoresis. And you have an image here that's kind of trying to illustrate this. Uh, and you find some weird stuff today where people talk about, you know, the divine dance of the Trinity. Like when I look up perichoresis, I, I looked at images to try to find something to stick on this PowerPoint. And a bunch of the images were, um, you know, women of different races dancing with one another. <laughs> okay, that's, that's an image of God or something. So it, it, it gives you an idea probably of the kind of stuff that you find, like a, that something that would identify you know, God is a woman kind of stuff. Um, so, so perichoresis does tend to be used by a lot of uh, theology that's a lot more liberal than the theology that I'm certainly promoting here. But for whatever for whatever reason, that has often been the case, and uh, it's often been used as kind of an alternative to a real shared unity of essence. That there can be this kind of divine dance of the persons that constitutes the unity rather than being a real shared essence, which can lead to some problems. But we'll leave that aside for now. Um, so the, the point of what Widener is saying here is he's saying that there is a, a mutual indwelling of one another. So imminence, meaning a, a closeness of one another between the persons. They inhere, exist in one another. And this is one of the things that distinguishes the triune persons from human people. And we've been talking in, in the last talk, we spoke a lot about the difference between human communities and human groups of people that have unity in one way or another and the unity of the divine. So the divine persons share a unity that goes far beyond something that we can use a human analogy for. And so one of the ways that we see that, that occurring is uh, in this perichoresis. So, you know, people don't, you know, when I when I walk around, uh, and, you know, go out to town, it's not like the people who are close to me are inherently with me in some way inside of my body or something. Uh, you know, that would be strange. Uh, but with God, it is the case that he cannot go somewhere without the other persons. And this is important because it shapes the way that we speak about about things. I've seen descriptions of the Trinity that uh, describe things almost as if the Father does this one thing kind of over here, 
and then the sun is over here and the spirit is over here so they have like different locations i even heard a theologian in the pca once say that god isn't actually present everywhere that the father is where he chooses to be or the son is where he chooses to be and god is not omnipresent in the fullest sense of the triune godhead which was very odd and not in line with the doctrine of the pca by any means but um something that you run into every once in a while so where do we get this from in scripture and that's a major question we're asking because we're trying to defend this idea that the trinity while the terms that we're using, the categories that we're using are ones that have developed throughout the tradition of the church, and we should keep them, and are they're good, <laughs> uh, but that these things are not just established solely on the basis of church tradition. Ultimately, the doctrine that we're referring to with these terms that have developed in, in tradition and history are doctrines that are derived from scripture. So where is perichoresis in scripture? Well, I have this one text here. Uh, this is from John 14, verses 10 through 11 where Jesus says this. He says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? So we have this, and this is why we speak about it being a kind of mutual eminence, a mutual interpenetration of the persons with within one another, so that the Father is in the Son, the Son is in the Father. So you see how this kind of language shows that there's, a, there's an intimacy or closeness of the triune persons that goes far beyond what we have in ordinary human relationships. He says, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. So here we have even the very works that the Son is doing are also the works of the Father. So the Father is doing the works and the Son is doing the works because the Father is doing the works in and through the Son. So they're doing the same work. And this is why we spoke before about the fact that the unity of essence also means that there's a unity of will and power so that the power of the Father works in the Son. So that as the Father is working, so also the Son is working, though there is an ordering from Father through Son. Uh, which clearly, again, this is very different from how people work. It's not the same as a relationship between a boss and employee, that the boss is literally doing his work through the employee. He could tell the employee what to do and try to get the employee to do it, but it's two separate wills and two separate powers. So you could try to get the employee to line up with his will to actually do the job. Um, but clearly this is something that goes goes far beyond that. Um so then he says, believe me, he repeats this again, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So John 14 is, is a text that demonstrates this. There are other texts as well, but this one is particularly clear, so I, I wanted to use this to say that there is a, a mysterious way in which the persons of the Godhead are actually within one another. So that's this this perichoresis, this intimacy between the persons. We have similar language that is used in our Christology. So if you watch the Christology series that I've done, you can uh, look at the discussions about the two natures of Christ and how the divine and human nature relate to one another, where Lutherans use this kind of same perichoretic language, where they say that the there is a, an intimacy of the divine and human natures in the singular person of Christ, that there is a you know flowing forth of the divine, a working of the divine attributes through the humanity. So we could speak about a perichoresis in terms of the two natures of Christ as well. So you may come across the term, in, certainly in Lutheran Christology. I don't know if it's really used in other Christological systems, because Lutherans, we do emphasize, uh, largely emphasize the unity of natures because of particular debates surrounding the Eucharist. But all right, so uh, then uh, that is, well, that's the end of the first section that we were talking about here in, in the opera at intra. So these are the internal works of the triune Godhead. And if you remember, we had this distinction that was made between the ad extra and ad intra works of the Trinity. So ad intra works are those works which are internal to the Godhead. So we defined those as, you know, spiration and generation. Uh, these, are, these are the things that are internal to God that have to do with the relationship between the three persons. But then we have, we're moving on then to talk about the external works of God. Now external, obviously, as the word sounds like, what we're saying is the things outside of God. So the things that aren't the relationship between the persons. So everything that God does in the world, everything that God does for us, everything that God does in creation or in redemption or in judgment, all of that is opera ad extra. These are the works external to the Godhead. Um, opera being works ad extra, you know, outside of uh, outside of God. So, okay. Um, 
So uh, the external works of God toward the world is what we're talking about. So that which has its end outside of himself towards something else. So add intra works are God toward himself, his own being. Add extra is working toward or outside of himself, toward others. Um, and I have the Latin phrase indivisa sunt here, the opera ad extra indivisa sunt, which means that the external works of God are undivided. And that phrase is telling us that when God does things in the world, he does them as triune. So God does not, does not act as father, then as son, then as Holy Spirit. And one person is doing all of the act acting without the others. Um, as we have already said before this, we looked at this idea of perichoresis, which means that where God is, there is all are all three persons, right? So it's not like the Father can go one place and the Son can go a different place. And we've already said that there is one working, one power, one will, which means that when God does something, God does that thing as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is a problem with a lot of social Trinitarianism, which tries to use more social human analogies about human community to describe the works of God, where we have the Father doing certain things that the Son can't do and vice versa. And uh, it, it starts to make a mess of things because the human community analogies break down pretty early on <laughs> when we're trying to, to make reference to the Godhead. I mean, they work for a time and for a certain purpose, but but ultimately they fall pretty short. All right, so we are then going to look at the question of inseparable operations, which is this principle that, that the works of God are inseparable, that they all operate together, by looking at a few instances of the scripture. And I have a whole separate hour on inseparable operations if you want to watch or listen to that for more details on this topic. Uh, but uh, let's take a look at three events uh, three particular things that God is involved with in the world where scripture clearly identifies all three persons at different points cooperating together. And there are plenty more of these, but this is just an example to show that this is how God operates in scripture. We have things being attributed to all three persons. So first we have uh, creation. Now, if you ask somebody like who created, which person of the God had created, pretty much everybody's going to say the father. We'll talk about appropriation below, which is related to this. Uh, and that's not wrong. But then the question is, right, we have Genesis 1.1, creation is the work of the Father. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we've got God that's identifying the Father there. Uh, but is it only the Father that's involved in creation? Is is the Son not involved in creation? Is the Spirit not involved? Is the, the, do the, uh, as one social Trinitarian says, do the Spirit and Son step back for the Father to work or limit their power so the Father can use his power. Uh, and, and that's in another program on social Trinitarianism. I dealt with that idea. But um, no, I think we see that other times in Scripture, the Son is very much involved. We're told in John 1, 3, where we have the famous prologue of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Through, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And so we're told that creation was a work of the Father, but that work of the Father was done through the Son. And then we have that exclusive, nothing was, was made without him. You know, So to say that, that it's not like the Father just happened to work sometimes through the Son, but that's the way the Father works, is through the Son. Right? That, the, the reason why the Father, why nothing was made without him is because it, it can't be the case. The father, this is how the Father works. The Father works through the Son. He doesn't uh, work as some kind of separate being. And then you go back. It, part of what John is doing here is giving a commentary on, on Genesis 1. And this is he uses the phrase that Jesus is the Logos. Jesus is the Word. The phrase Logos has a kind of twofold reference here. I think there is a, a sense in which he's speaking to uh, the Greco-Roman audience here who had an idea of a Logos as this mediator, in, especially in Stoicism. But he's certainly using this term logos or word to refer to what God is doing in Genesis 1, where God the Father speaks, and it is through that act of speech that creation comes into existence. So by speaking about Jesus as the, the logos or as the word, he's saying that when the Father spoke and creation came into existence, uh, that that was actually the act of 
of the son like god's word the word that is of god so again we have that eternal generation as being of god the word of god is that through which creation was made and then we may have the question well what about the holy spirit what's the role of the holy spirit well the holy spirit shows up in genesis 1 2 <laughs> so you know if you're asking we could talk about the trinity in the old testament and that would be worth spending some some time on but when we're looking at the the role of the spirit and say, well, where does the spirit show up? I mean, he shows up the next verse, right? The spirit is hovering above the waters. So the spirit of God being the one that proceeds from, from the father, he is there hovering above the water. So he's active there within creation. And so we see in the very first couple chapters for a couple verses of the Bible itself, that we have uh, the father creating through his word, which is the logos, and then the role of the spirit in creation. So the father, son, and spirit are all intimately involved in the act of creation. Then once we get to new creation, the regeneration, the spirit tends to be to take kind of the central role there. The central focus tends to be on the Holy Spirit and bringing about, about new creation. Uh you know, such as really beginning at the baptism of Jesus, where the Spirit comes down in the form of a dove and and declares that, you know, the Father declares that this is his Son, that becomes kind of paradigmatic then for what happens in our baptisms as the Spirit uh, comes upon us and makes us new creations. So, Spirit's role in creation and new creation as well. And we could certainly have plenty of texts that show that the Father, Son, and Spirit are also involved in, in new creation. So creation is a great example to show that, that there is both an ordering to the triune persons in their acts, but that it is one act. So that it is the Father through the Son and then the Spirit. So we have this Father to Son to Spirit kind of pipeline, right, in, in how God works. So we're not saying that and there's a criticism of inseparable operations that would say that what we're doing is just conflating the person so they're exactly the same. And now there is no distinction. We've made one person. We're not saying that. I'm not saying that the father and the son's role is identical here because we're not told that creation is through the father and from the son, but it's from the father through the son. So we have a, a distinction here. And the distinction is the outgrowth of what is true eternally about God. So that's why that, that eternal ordering in ontologies, we're going to talk about economic and ontological trinity, we'll, we'll get there. Um, but the ordering that is true about God at intra in his eternal being is then reflected at extra in how he works in the world. So that eternal ordering of father to son to spirit is not just kind of a happenstance that that's how God works in history, but that's his eternal nature. And then it flows, flowing out of that is how God works in history. All right, so there's 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 creation, an event that we often speak about as God the Father. Biblically, we see that it's the Father, Son, and Spirit who are involved. Uh, I mentioned here the next point, which is the resurrection, the resurrection of, of Jesus. And if you ask who brought Jesus back from the dead, you maybe think the Father. <laughs> I'm thinking like, who, who would you usually uh, associate with that if you ask just the average person, which person was that? Uh, probably the Father, I would assume, in the same way. The Son died, the Father brought the Son back from the dead. Um, and Romans 6, 4 is a text that specifically identifies the Father uh, there. But then we also have in John chapter 2, where Jesus uses the analogy of the temple. He's speaking about his body, but it's unknown at that time that he's speaking about his body. He says, if you destroy the temple, I will raise it again in three days. They think he's talking about the literal physical temple in Israel, the place of worship. But John tells us, no, Jesus meant his body, the temple. So, But he says, I will raise it in three days. So it, it's not just the power of the Father that raises the Son, but it's also the power of Jesus himself. Whereas he could even say, you know, I I brought myself back from the dead. <laughs> um, so so he, he it's his power as well that brought himself back from the dead. So just as the power of Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead, so does the uh, yeah, so is the power of, the, of Jesus bring himself back from the dead in, in uh, the same way. All right. So then we have uh, the role of the Spirit as well. The Spirit is connected. I have Roman, or 1 Peter 3.18 there that, that the Spirit makes uh, Jesus alive. Then we have the doctrine of election. Election is another one that we tend to just associate with the Father, which makes sense. The Father chooses, the Father chooses us into salvation even before the creation of the world, even before the foundation of the world, God chose us in Christ. So we have Ephesians chapter one, 
which clearly identifies the father as the instrument of election. That's the most common identification that we have as the father is the one who elects. But then we have also the son. Uh, this, and he says, I chose you. He's talking specifically about the disciples, but but I think from this, we, we can extrapolate something beyond that, which is Jesus is saying he's, he's also making the choice of who is following him. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And, and so Jesus is also involved in the electing activity of God, not just the Father. And then we see the Spirit mentioned in 1 Peter 1, 2, which speaks about uh, predestination uh, that is through the sanctification of the Spirit. So the Spirit is involved in election as well. So again, in the in election, we're not saying that the Father, Son, and Spirit are exactly identical persons, but that you have that same kind of working of the Father through the Son, through the Spirit. Now, at the end of this, I, I mentioned, I have a final point on uh, this, this question of the external works of the Godhead and inseparable operations of Trinitarian appropriation. Uh, what do we mean by, uh, what do I mean by appropriation? Uh, what I mean is that one person of the Trinity often kind of appropriates in, in our language certain elements of redemption. So we, for example, in Luther's, Martin Luther's small catechism, which as a Lutheran pastor, I use all the time and teach from and <laughs> teach my kids. And, uh, you know, uh, we have the three articles of the creed that are divided up into the triune persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And they're also divided up into the works of God of creation, redemption, and sanctification. Because we divide things out this way, and I speak generally the Father as is, is being in relation to creation, am I making the statement that only the Father creates? That's not the point of that, right? We're, we're not trying to, to say that. You could, this could even lead to a modalist view if you, if you take that too strongly, this idea that the Father kind of changes forms. So when he's creating, he's the Father, and then when he's redeeming, he's the Son, and then when he's sanctifying, he's the Spirit. No, he's all three in all of those all of those circumstances. But we do see that in scripture, in each of those places, one person kind of s steps up to the front in our view of things, right? We, we tend, to see, tend to see more emphasis of one person than the other on each of these things. So uh, the father is generally the one to whom creation is, is attributed. Of course, knowing, we, we, we can say that, yeah, the father creates, we just have to know that underneath that, that doesn't mean only the father but that of course he does this through the Son and the Spirit. Uh, the fact that we appropriate redemption to the Son makes a lot of sense because it's only the Son that's incarnate. <laughs> uh, and inseparable operations does not mean that the Father is also incarnate and the Spirit is incarnate. But what it does mean is that the works of the incarnate Christ are not done through the Logos alone, but that also the Father and the Spirit are working through the person of Jesus throughout his life so that the works of Jesus are also the works of the Father and the Son. And we see a lot of that language in uh, like John chapter five and where, where Jesus talks extensively about him doing the works of his Father. So that we're, yeah, we're not saying that the Son and, and the Father and Spirit are all incarnate, that would lead you to all sorts of weird places. But, um, but what we are saying is when we're talking about redemption, they are all involved. So it makes sense for us to appropriate redemption primarily to the Son, obviously. But that that's not exclusive, that redemption was the son divorced from the work of the Father and the Spirit. And the same is true about sanctification. Now, we're, sanctification, we think about the Spirit, that makes a lot of sense because biblically, the Spirit is very involved in sanctification. Uh, the Spirit, Ezekiel 36, the Spirit is the one who brings about the new heart, we are told. We see the Spirit being the one who appears at Pentecost as tongues of fire. So the spirit is intimately involved in the work of sanctification and tends to be the one that regeneration and sanctification is most often tied to. That doesn't mean, though, that the other persons aren't also involved. Paul can also say that Christ lives in me. We often think of, well, God indwells you, that's the Holy Spirit. Well, okay, that's true, but it's also the other two persons. So that's why Paul can say Christ lives in me, not just the Holy Spirit. So, whereas we emphasize the Holy Spirit, we, we appropriate that work of sanctification primarily to the Holy Spirit in, in the way that we speak, we're not using that in an exclusive sense. So, what you don't need to do is, you don't need to like read Luther's Catechism and then clarify all of your statements to make sure you're Orthodox. <laughs> so, and I had someone ask me this before when I did my program on, on uh, 
Inseparable operations was like, what do we do about the catechism? You don't have to, when we're using language to speak about God, we have to recognize all the language we use is imperfect. You don't need to caveat everything you say because that would make theological dialogue on a popular level basically impossible. And I see this sometimes with people when they get into theology of proper, or Trinitarian theology, they, they really want to be as precise as possible, which is good. The impetus is good. But sometimes their desire for precision means that they qualify everything they say so they can just never speak clearly. And Scripture doesn't do that. Scripture qualifies things, but Scripture also is pretty free in its language just to say things in a way that you understand. So you can speak freely about the Father creating and the Son redeeming and the Spirit sanctifying without every time you're mentioning that having to step back and say, by the way, and then clarify the inseparable operations. Um, sometimes should you explain that? Yeah. If you're, you know, preaching on it, I'm not saying you shouldn't explain it, but you don't need to caveat things every time you do that. Scripture is plenty willing to just kind of say things as they are without making those caveats all the time, because it can make you really annoying to listen to, like listening to me when I clarify everything because I'm a systematic theologian. <laughs> so, all right. Um, so uh, we're going to make another distinction then in, in Trinitarian theology and this distinction is very similar to the distinction between ad intra and ad extra. And that is the difference between ontology and economy. So ontology is, is being, I'm talking about the study of being, the study of ontology. Uh, and economy is what happens in history. Okay. So we're talking about God's eternal being and himself versus how God works in the world. So you see how there's that ad intra ontology, ad extra economy connection. Um, the individual on the slide here is Karl Rahner. So we're going to talk about something that, that he says here related to ontology and economy. Um, okay, so th we have the economic trinity, and then we also have the ontological trinity. Now, the economic trinity is God as he works in redemption in history outside of himself. So we're talking about the ad extra acts of God. So, for example, the sun is incarnate, the spirit appears in the form of a dove, the spirit appears in the form of fire. These are things that God does outside of himself in creation itself. We can speak about Trinitarian missions. This is language that, that's often used. People talk about the missions of the triune persons on earth. So th this is generally what scripture is focused on. Scripture primarily is focused on the economy of redemption. Scripture is is broadly a narrative about a human people that have fallen and human people that need to be redeemed and God's plan of and working out of redemption for people. So the ad extra aspects of the Trinity, the ad extra works of God, the economic Trinity is the focus of scripture. You know, scripture is not written as a, a deep metaphysical treatise on the nature of who God is in himself. That's not really the point of scripture. However, that doesn't mean that we ignore that, that. There are clear conclusions that we can come to about who God is in himself throughout the text of scripture as we have been looking at. So we don't need to pit these two things against each other or say that, well, the questions of who God is in himself are just irrelevant. Scripture has plenty to say about those things as well. Uh, and, and some people tend to think those questions are too abstract and we can just kind of ignore them. Uh, we are not called to ignore them because God has revealed aspects about who he is in himself to us. And so we need to speak about it as God has revealed. However, we recognize that scripture primarily is going to be dealing with the divine economy. Okay, uh, so the economic trinity is God's work in, in salvation. The ontological trinity then is God as he is in himself. So the ontological trinity, the eternal relations of Father, Son, and Spirit, all the things that uh, we talked about last time in terms of uh, ad intra relations. Now, Karl Rahner is a, a Roman Catholic theologian, one of the most influential Catholic theologians in the, and one of the most influential theologians in general within the 20th century. And Rahner came up with a what's known as Rahner's Rule to speak about the relationship between the economic and ontological trinity. So there are debates uh, about the economic and ontological trinity. Uh, there are debates about how they relate to one another. Uh, there is a concern if, if you have, a, you know, God's economy is totally divorced from his being, you, you end up with kind of two trinities. So there is a, there's certainly a danger in 
divorcing ontology from economy because if you do that you've got kind of one trinity who's kind of back here by himself and you've got the other trinity who's out here in the world <laughs> so you don't want to divorce these these two things so Rahner comes up with this rule that says the economic trinity is the ontological trinity or the ontological trinity is the economic trinity they're the same so uh, we can perfectly identify the divine economy with ontology. Now, Rahner's rule becomes very significant in the 20th century. Most Trinitarian theologians in the West adopt some form of, of Rahner's rule. But this rule does tend to lead towards some odd views that are significant departures from classical Trinitarianism. And you don't see this so much in Karl Rahner as you do in theologians that develop and use uh, his rule after him. So what I'm going to do here is distinguish between two different models of Trinitarianism in relation to how ontology and economy relate to one another. Um, so we could say on the one hand, ontology equals o economy. We could say that they're the same, uh, as Rahner would say. But uh, we could also come up with a couple different models. The classic Trinitarian model is this, that ontology is the basis for the economy. So who God is in himself is the basis for what God does in history. So that there isn't this strong divorce between history and, and ontology, so that how God works out in history is a reflection of who God is in himself. So I'd say ontology is revealed in economy, Right? So the only reason that we know anything about who God is in himself is because he's spoken to us in the economy and demonstrated it to us in the economy. So the only reason we know anything about who God is is because he has communicated it to us graciously in, in the history of, of redemption. But ontology is also, it's not just that it's the ontology is revealed in the economy as if the economy is something totally distinct, but the ontology is also the basis of economy. So for example, this is why we say that the, the eternal relations of origin of father and son are reflected in the sending of the son by the father. So in history, the father sends the son, which is a reflection of the fact that eternally the son has the relationship of son with the father. So he's etern he eternally has his origin uh, from the father. And this is an argument that I make dealing with the filioque as well is that in the economy, it's very clear that we also see that the spirit is sent by the son. And I, I, so, for example, this, and I mentioned this earlier, the son breathes out the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. And as the, the son breathes the spirit out on the disciples, this is the delivering of the spirit now um, to, uh, to the church, which then leads to Pentecost. So the very sending of the Spirit to the church is through the Son. It is Father, Son, Spirit. We have the same ordering that we have uh, eternally. So I'm going to say that what happens in the economy where the Son sends the Spirit, and we're never told the other way around, okay? We're never told that the Spirit sends the Son. We're only told that the Son sends the Spirit. That that economic activity similarly is based in ontology. So the, the economic sending of the Spirit from the Son is an outgrowth of those ad intra relations. So the ad intra relations then work themselves out in history. So it reveals to us then something that is true about God as he is in, in himself. And so I do think that in some Eastern theologies, as I prepared for my last program I did on the, uh, in this, on the Filioque, um, I, uh, and I read different Eastern Orthodox critiques of the Filioque and they deal with it differently. There, something that's very clear is that there are a number of formulations. There's no clear one Eastern doctrine of how the Spirit and Son and Father relate to one another. There are many different takes. But at least in some of the things that, that I read, there was this em emphasis on the strong distinction between the relations of origin and the, and the economy. So that there's nothing to the kind of sun spirit economic sun sending the spirit that reflects at all on the economy. It's just how things worked out in history. Uh, so, so I think what Rahner's rule does it guards against some of that because I think you have this dangerous divorce. But then the problem with Rahner's rule is, well, where people kind of take it post Rahner, and so that is in what I'm calling post Bardian Trinitarianism, and. To be 
to clarify what the heck do I mean by post-Bardian, if, you know, because this is an introductory lecture, so you may not be familiar with any of the terms that I'm using here, so I'm trying to define them all. Uh, Bart, Karl Barth is a very influential 20th century theologian, uh, and just like Rahner was that we discussed, but Bart's more influential. I mean, Bart is pretty much kind of by far the most significant 20th century theological thinker in, in the Christian world. I mean, I think that's that's pretty much undisputed. It's, it's just kind of clear with his, his impact. Uh, Bart revitalizes Trinitarian theology in some significant ways in its importance for the church. Because in, a, in the era of the 19th century, you have the rise of Protestant liberalism, and Protestant liberalism doesn't tend to have much use for the doctrine of the Trinity. They especially don't have any use for ontology. There's really no discussion of who God is in himself at all. Someone like uh, Albert Ritchell, very influential 19th century Protestant liberal theologian, uh, would say essentially that what, what matters about God is really how he impacts us in our moral commitments and our creation of a moral community that is the kingdom of God. Or someone like Schleiermacher coming before Ritchell uh, would say that what's of prime importance is our really our experience and our encounter with God, our experience with God through this, what he calls a feeling of, of absolute dependence upon God. So what we know about God is not really anything about who he is in himself, but simply how he relates to us for these thinkers. And when that happens, the Trinity becomes kind of abstract and useless because the Trinity doesn't have a function. It's just who God is in himself, and that's not really important because Christianity is really about my my experience or the community of the church or morality or something else. So in, in all of those ways, we don't really have any uh, real essential purpose uh, in, in their view of the the doctrine of the Trinity when we're taking, talking about those kind of eternal relations. You just get rid of that talk altogether. Now, Karl Barth is the founder of what's often referred to as neo-orthodoxy in the 20th century. And with neo-orthodoxy, Karl Barth starts to begin to emphasize some of these classical Christian doctrines that the, the Protestant liberals just didn't really have any use for at all. And one of those doctrines is the doctrine of of the trinity so bart revitalizes the doctrine of the trinity uh, i may perhaps do a whole program on bart and theologians following bart and what they do with the trinity um but there is some debate as to how close bart's doctrine of the trinity actually is to a classical trinitarian doctrine he's certainly critical at least of some elements of classical trinitarianism there are different interpretations of bart that take him in different directions so not everybody's agreed on exactly what he does uh, but there is a group of theologians that I am referring to as post-Bardian. Now, that particular term has often been used to refer to the, the theologian Jürgen Moltmann, who is a German Reformed thinker, um, who wrote a book, a Trinity and Kingdom, which is on the Trinity, and he's written a number of other things related to the, to, to the Trinity, his Trinitarian theology, his theology of hope, and the crucified God touch on these, these questions pretty significantly as well. Um, but post-Bardian, the post-Bardian movement, these are theologians that are influenced by Barth, but take Barth in some different directions. So you have Jürgen Moltmann, Wolfhard Pannenberg, Robert Jensen, uh, Karl Broughton, Colin Gunton, to some extent, though he's probably a little different than, than some of the others, not as, I think probably not as clear on some of these issues where they really depart from classical Trinitarianism. Um, and I think this is most clear probably in Moltmann and, and Pannenberg more than anybody else. Um, but this is the notion that they develop the idea that God exists within time. Uh, so they believe that the questions of divine the conviction of divine atemporality, this classical conviction that God exists totally outside of and apart from the confines of time altogether, they see that more as a Greek philosophical construct than they do as something that is actually founded within the text of Scripture. And they would say, well, the Scripture is really more of a narrative where God really interacts with his people. We don't see God throughout the biblical narrative as being totally separate from the world in this kind of separate eternal realm, but he seems to be really actively involved. He seems to change his mind. He seems to uh, really do things in history and relate to people in, in a way that they would say the classical theology does not really allow for. And because of Rahner's rule, and now there is this, this stronger emphasis on the relationship between ontology and economy, they start to really conflate the two, and essentially the conclusion they come to 
is that the economy really determines ontology. Okay, the economy determines ontology. What, what I mean by that then is what God does in history determines who God is eternally. So whereas classical theology says that who God is eternally is revealed in and the basis of the economy, the economy does not change God. Okay, so in the events of redemption, God himself has not changed. God is always immutable. So God does not, you know, the incarnation doesn't change God. The incarnation does change the humanity. It, it brings a humanity into the Godhead as there is a full, complete human nature, but the divine nature doesn't change through the incarnation, right? So something changes, obviously, because there is a God who's not incarnate and now a God who is, but the divine nature itself doesn't change, but a changeable, mutable human nature has been brought into the Godhead. So the change is on the side of the, of the humanity, in other words, not the divinity itself. Um, and, and that's the way that the economy always works. So the change is always happening, not on God's end, but on and creation's end, on our end. We're the ones that change. As God says, I, the Lord, do not change. Now, clearly in scripture, you do have plenty of times where God seems to do things like change his mind and repent. But this is all really use of, of analogous language and divine accommodation. Uh, and this would have to be a separate program too, but a divine accommodation being the fact that God accommodates to us and acts in ways that we would understand that makes sense to us. And so the divine accommodation means that he reveals himself to us in ways because of our finitude and limited nature. They don't reveal the essence of who he totally is in himself, but he reveals himself in a way that makes sense to us. That is, that is relational. Um, so the post bardians though, would say instead that God's eternal being is determined by what he does in history. This is related to a particular interpretation of Karl Barth. And Karl Barth has, it's at least been claimed that Karl Barth's theology is one of actualism. Now Barth's actualism is this idea that God's act determines God's essence. And in particular, Karl Barth has a unique doctrine of election where he speaks about how Jesus, the son, is, is the chosen. He is the elect one. He's also the reprobate one. You have a double predestinarianism there. But in Jesus, God is choosing to be the God of, of Jesus. He is choosing to be the God who is revealed in Jesus. And what Barth means by that, at least according to some interpretations, is that now God is choosing to his own nature, essentially. So God's nature changes depending on his choice. He chooses who he's going to be, which is the opposite of God's acts in history or his decree being an outflow of his nature. Now the decree determines his nature. You see the, the difference there. Um, so with post-Bardian Trinitarianism, sometimes these thinkers even want to have a way to define Trinity, the Trinity itself by history. In other words, God is triune because of the way he acts in history. So Jürgen Moltmann, for example, sees the, he speaks about the death of Jesus on the cross, particularly the, the cry of dereliction where Jesus cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It, Moltmann views that cry as this kind of rupture between persons that then creates the unity between father and son. I know it sounds odd, there's kind of Hegel in the background, but this is too introductory to talk about all of the stuff going on there. But essentially, what you need to know for the purposes of what we're talking about now is just that the, the relation between father and son for Moltmann is in some way determined by what God does in history. So that history determines God's being, rather than God's being determining history. There are a lot of problems with this. God now seems to be dependent upon us to be who he is. Uh, he seems to be dependent upon creation to truly be the God who he is. Now we can change him. Now they're, they're going to say certain things like, well, God chooses, God sovereignly chooses to be changed by us. God chooses to be affected by us. So it's kind of God is still sovereign over the way that we change him. But in some way, we are still determining um, who God is. Uh, or others would say that, you know, the resurrection is somehow determinative of who God is. Uh, so Wolfhard Pannenberg, for example, comes up with this idea that the the, divin the very divinity of the sun is determined by the economy. 
So the resurrection of Jesus constitutes his divinity. So he is divine because he's the resurrected one, but that also means that now he has been divine from all eternity, but because of an event in history. So instead of this being true of God and revealing himself in history, God now is eternally who he is because of what he's done in history. So those are some of the ways that you see this play out in some in some Trinitarianism today. Now, though, there are obviously more extreme extreme positions on this than than others. If Barr is an actualist, his position isn't doesn't nearly go as far as some of these uh, later thinkers do. So Rahner's rule ends up, in my view, causing more problems than it solves <laughs> um, because of largely what it leads to. So what I would say is we can't divide the economic and ontological trinity as if they're two trinities. Um, so there is a sense in which Rahner's right, in which it's not a different trinity that reveals itself in the economy. It's, it is the ontological trinity. But we have to, we do have to distinguish in some way what God does outside of himself from who God is in himself. So that they're intimately tied together. God in himself becomes the basis for what he does outside of himself. But the ad intra, ad extra distinctions are really essential. If you get rid of any ad extra, ad intra distinctions, now the works of God outside of himself affect who he is, and he is no longer a self-existent being. And hopefully you can see why saying God was not is not self-existent, not that people would say that, uh, why that would be a problem. Because that in scripture oftentimes is kind of the very definition of what makes God God and what differentiates the true God of Israel against the uh, pagan idols of the nation surrounding Israel. All right. So then I want to talk uh, as, a, as a final point here in this, and this will finish our intro discussion of aspects of the Trinity. The question of what do we do with analogies? Now, as many Lutherans know, <laughs> if you've seen Lutheran satire, there's the very popular video that Hans Feeney put together uh, where he talks about how how unuseful analogies are because if you use analogies, it you end up coming to some kind of a heretical position necessarily by use of any analogies. So I have the image here of the, the three-leaf clover, which says Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, uh, you know, in that in that video, you have St. Patrick trying to explain this, and, uh, and he's told, that's partialism, Patrick. So uh, partialism being this idea that the Father is part of God, the Son is part of God, and the Holy Spirit is part of God. Scripture doesn't say that they're parts of God because then they're not fully God themselves. So, uh, so we don't want to go with the partialist view. Now, if you're going to take the three-leaf clover analogy so far, you do end up with partialism, right? Because you, you do end up saying that, well, I mean, one leaf isn't the three-leaf clover, so none of them are the three-leaf clover. There's one three-leaf clover, but three parts that make up the three-leaf clover. And I have heard Christians use language of parts to refer to the Trinity. That's not that's not the right way of speaking about the Trinity um, because scripture does not tell you that Jesus is part God. He's fully God and the Father is fully God and the Spirit is fully God. This is one of the ways that the, the, the nature of this unity of essence is strongly differentiated from how it is in a human person. So the fullness of the divine essence it, inheres in all three persons and no more than that um, so that they are they are each fully got the completeness of the divine essence inheres in all three um, so yeah of course that's a problem with the three-leaf clover analogy and then you know you can look at at really any analogy that you have and all of them are going to fall short so you've got the analogy that's often used of you know ice and water and steam so that you know, water has three different three different forms, right? It can be a solid or a liquid or a gas, depending on um, on the temperature. Well, that's one thing, but it's also three things at the same time. So God is also one thing, but also three things. Okay, well, that maybe sounds okay, but if you take that analogy too far, how does the ice exist with the water? Well, the ice becomes water. Right? Or how does the water become steam? Well, it becomes steam when the condition changes. So is that what we're saying with God, that uh, he changes depending on the circumstance? Uh, 
is God sometimes ice, sometimes water, sometimes steam? You know, does he become the father, then the son, then the spirit? You see people in history doing this. And I want to do another one of these on like heretical Trinitarian ideas, because I think studying the heresies helps you to gain a better understanding of what is true sometimes because it clarifies misunderstandings. Um, but does God, you know, is God, uh, some people come up with this idea that God was the father in the past. And then at the time of the New Testament, God was the son. And then uh, at Pentecost, God becomes the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, the water, ice, steam analogy does kind of lean toward that if you take it too far. People use the analogy of the egg, right? There are three parts of, of the egg, and each of them is egg. It has egg DNA, but there are three separate things that are very different that all share egg DNA. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, it's okay as far as it goes. But again, you could fall into this idea of partialism because is the shell of an egg an egg? Well, it's part of an egg. <laughs> it's really not an egg, right? It's fullness. So it doesn't it doesn't really, really work uh, that well. Now, there simply really isn't a great human analogy for the Trinity. And people use like, uh, you know, intellect and, and uh, memory and, and will, will, intellect, memory as an analogy. Um, someone like St. Augustine will, will talk about these kind of intimations of the Trinity in nature that we have you know, triune uh, re reflections of the triune God in nature. A and I think if we're talking about the, you know, analogies, I would differentiate analogy versus reflections of triunity in nature. So an analogy is using an imperfect thing to try to make a symbol of what the Trinity is. You also though, do have these triune kind of reflections in nature. They're, the number three does show up in our lives and in the world in ways that do reflect something of God's nature, these intimations of the Trinity. And that's what Augustine uh, is going to say. So uh, what, one, here's one example is, um, you know, I'm interested in aesthetics. I love aesthetics dealing with uh, art and any kind of design. Uh, there is something interesting about the, the human eye that you tend to be more attracted to objects in a series of threes. We're created to do that. We are. We, we naturally are more delighted by seeing, you know, if you have a set of random objects on a shelf somewhere, we're, we naturally are drawn more toward a, a set of three objects than we are two uh, or four. So I think there probably is something creational about that. There's maybe a, an imprint of the Trinity in, in our minds and our created nature that, lead, that leads us toward that. So there are these kind of intimations of the Trinity. Um, but we don't want to take this too far. So here are some points that Widener mentions here with the use of analogies and whether analogies are useful or, or not. Um, so the first is they don't prove the doctrine of the Trinity, but only serve to illustrate. Now you do have theologians throughout the years trying to make some kind of apologetic arguments that God must be three. And you take threes in nature and say, well, if this is true in nature, this must mean that God himself is three. Those arguments are really not compelling, right? So uh, they, it, it is true that if you already believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, you could see images of that or vestiges of that doctrine in creation, but there never has been a really compelling philosophical argument formulated that teaches the doctrine of the Trinity from just pure reason alone. So this is why Thomas Aquinas would say that the doctrine of the Trinity is a revealed doctrine. Uh, it, it, it's only a doctrine that we understand because of God's supernatural revelation, because he's revealed to us that, he's, that he is three. Uh, and, and he would say that things like the existence of God are clear through nature. You can make a good rational argument that God must exist. You can make a good rational argument that God is simple, that God is powerful, that God is good. But you can't really make a compelling logical case without supernatural revelation that God must be three persons. It just is there. And every time people attempt it, I think it's it it really falls short. Lutheran theologians tend to agree with Aquinas here, and when they discuss these arguments, pretty much unanimously say they don't really work very well. All right, number two, they don't generate faith, but only instill human opinion. So you're not gonna, you know, have faith created by this analogy of the use of the Trinity. We're using human illustration uh, when when you do it. So don't use it really in apologetic context is really what we're saying here. Um, don't, you know, if you're in an apologetic context, don't try to use the, you know, don't try to use the three-leaf clover example. It's more than anything else is just going to confuse the person and give them a wrong idea. Um, 
Uh, they, these are these analogies. Uh, the third point, he says, they don't convince an adversary, but they delight the believer. So, they, you know, they, they can be used to give encouragement to the believer. And so, for example, when when it was uh, St. Patrick's Day in church and Sunday school, my kids did get the three leaf clover with the Father, Son, and Spirit on the leaves. Now, is it a perfect analogy of the Trinity? No. Am I going to complain that a kid who has imperfect understanding, a young kid, is going to hold an object that's going to remind him of the Father, Son, and Spirit? No, of course not. It's like, it's it's fine in a particular context, but severely limited in its use. Okay, so so it perhaps can use be used kind of as a teaching tool, especially for, for little kids. But once they get to a certain age, then you kind of start to explain it's not really how it works. But, you know, you got a four-year-old kid. That's great. They've got their little three-leaf clover. They know Father, Son, and Spirit. And that's the innocent faith of a child. They don't have the intellectual capacity to work out all the particulars, and that's fine. Uh, they're a child. <laughs> so so it's fine. I think it's fine as far as it goes, but you have to recognize the, the limits. Um, the fourth point is they present more unlikeness than likeness. And, and this is really key, is you know, you can use analogies to some extent, but God is so unlike us that we have to recognize the limits in those analogies. Um, I I don't think that, in a, you know, I, I appreciate the points that, you know, Hans Feeney's video that the Lutheran satire video makes. I mean, I think it's, you know, he, he's, he's right. And it actually has been. Uh, I've known kids in confirmation class that use that video and they recognize Trinitarian heresies because of the video, because it's funny. So it actually works really well as a teaching tool. Um but, you know, am I going to make an absolute statement? You can't use those analogies? No. Um, I, I think any analogy that we use with God is ultimately inadequate. Everything we say about God is inadequate in, in some sense. But God condescends to our human language and human imagery. So we can use it to an extent. But the fifth point here I think is the most important is that they're to be used with prudence and caution. So just be cautious about how you use analogies. Uh, Oftentimes they do end up causing more harm than good, but I don't, I wouldn't give an absolute condemnation of the using of Trinitarian analogies, especially to a child. Um, because scripture does accommodate to our human language, it does use analogies, uh, and it uses analogies that always don't line up in a perfect one to one correlation with what reality is. So we have instances of like God repenting in scripture, that's analogous language. Is it theologically accurate in the fullest sense that God repents? No. Scripture also says God doesn't repent. Um, So, uh, but is scripture wrong in saying that? No, it's not wrong. It's using analogous language. It's just a way of of communicating that that God does. So so I think it's fine to some extent. Uh, All right. Well, this is the end of our introduction to to Trinitarian language, Trinitarian um, ideas and, and terminology. So we have part one, which goes through uh, scriptural defense of the Trinity, number two, uh, second program we did, which goes through the basic uh, language of Trinitarian discourse, showing where generation and procession show up in in scripture, how these are biblical doctrines, speaking about how they relate to one another, the persons. Uh, and then this third program talks about, we've gone now through the ad intra and ad extra uh, operations of God, how God as triune works in the world, and the use of, of analogies. Um, so I do want to record more of these. Hopefully, if you guys are interested in them, hopefully you are. I would like to do some things on, on history. We can look at early Trinitarian heresies and look at the development of the doctrine of the Trinity among the church fathers. So thanks so much for watching and or listening. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and on your podcast app, and we will see you in the next video or podcast. God bless.